there's a mistake here that to, to imagine that to understand somebody else's framework and to listen to what they have to say means that you therefore agree with it. That's not right. But it does mean that if you're going to engage in some communication and you're going to try and work out how to respond, you've got to listen to how they see the world. And it's not how you see the world. Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with Hillary Lawson, an English philosopher. His book, Closure, develops a comprehensive system of non-realist metaphysics. He is also an award-winning broadcaster who founded the Institute of Art and Ideas to bring philosophy and intellectual ideas into public discourse. Welcome, Hillary. I've been looking forward to our conversation for a long time. And, uh, and so have I, Robert. Very good, to, very good to be here with you. So we want to focus on closure, your main work, but I think we should lay its foundation first, the, the flow of your philosophical ideas. First, very briefly to get people an overview, then a little more depth, then into closure. So you call realism a philosophical mistake. Now, realism being the view that science reveals the world as it really is, you say that's a philosophical mistake. You write, realism has failed. Relativism, some people think it's the opposite, but it may not be, is incoherent. So we must develop a new philosophy that is neither realist nor relativist. So begin, why has realism failed? Well, I think my understanding of realism is about believing that language describes or can describe how things are actually, as you say, in the world. And science would be an example of that. I think you could be a realist about language without, without necessarily being a realist about science. But uh, I, I would challenge uh, realism on the grounds that uh, the attempts to try and describe the relationship between language and the world have, uh, have failed. I mean, back uh, when analytic philosophy was, uh, was initiated with uh, Russell and Wittgenstein a hundred, little bit more than a hundred years ago, they were a breath of fresh air, of course. They, they came in and uh, took issue with uh, Hegelian metaphysics, which had be, previously been around. And they said instead, no, uh, no we, we need to be really clear about how language refers to the world. And we need to account of that relationship and we need to get it really tight. And then science within that overall framework can identify the facts and build theories which uncover the truth. But I don't think that project has worked. I'm not alone in that. I wouldn't claim uh, any originality in this. Hilary Putnam, a major uh, philosopher, American philosopher, said that the project to uh, describe uh, the relationship between language and the world was a shambles. Um, and indeed, that realism is the idea that you can you can have a view from nowhere, that you can somehow be not perspectival, have no context, and just see how things are absolutely. And I think it just hasn't worked. So then is realism uh, an epistemological failure in that human minds through language cannot apprehend the absolute ra reality because of this disconnect with language, and perhaps not even in principle? but not more fundamentally an ontological failure in that there is no absolute reality. That's not what you're saying. Well, I've had this uh, conversation with John Searle, again, the American philosopher, and, and I wouldn't really buy the distinction between the epistemological and the ontological because um, it, it, that already assumes the ontology, na namely that we are seeing things and there's a question of how we describe whatever it is that's that's out there. And, and I think the puzzle is deeper than that. The puzzle is, what is the relationship between our language or our thought and what is other than language or thought? What is that relationship? And realists have the idea that language or thought, I, I say or thought, once upon a time, philosophers only really talked about thought, and then in the 20th century, they, they talked about language instead. And, and I think that what they, um, what they sort of identified 
was that um, uh, there is a puzzle about how language is referring to whatever is other than language, how thought is referring to whatever other is thought. And that is the issue. And realists somehow think that thought or language can actually get at what's out there, whatever that relationship is. And, and non-realists, I wouldn't say anti-realists, necessarily non-realists like myself think that that's not right, that um, that's not what language is doing. It's not describing some ultimate reality out there. It's doing something else. And then there's a whole puzzle of, well, if it's doing something else, why is it so successful? <laughs> why, why can we do all of the amazing things we can do with thought and, and so forth if it's not somehow uncovering how things ultimately are? Hmm. Okay, um, you bring up a distinction, which I think is important between anti-realism, which you say you are not, and non-realist, which is, sounds like a more neutral term. And then you go on to use the term post-realist. Yeah. Yes. And the reason for that is, is, a, is a key one, really. The, the first, first uh, you know, philosopher, uh, philosophical book that I wrote was about self-reference and the problems of self-reference, which is when you say something and it doesn't make sense when applied to itself. And indeed, Wittgenstein identified that the very problem of trying to describe the relationship between language and the world founders on the self-referential issue that he tried to do this in the in his major work in the Tractatus. And uh, he identified that the very work itself, the Tractatus, is not something that language can do. So it sort of undermined itself in the process. Yeah, and you, and you have called self-reference the central flaw that undermines realism. Yes, well, because it's sort of like, it's, it's unrecoverable. You know, that there's nowhere to go. Um, in order to I I escape from that problem. And, and that's because, um, you know, if you're describing the relationship between language and the world, you can't do that from just inside language because you, you can never somehow get to the world. Um, uh, and the, uh, the theory itself I is questionable. So the reason I say non-realism is because if you said you were anti-realist, it would be somehow denying reality. But if you could deny reality, you would have known how things are in some absolute way. You would have, you would have cracked that's it. Self it. That's suffering for you, us. You, you would have it. So, so I don't think that anti-realism makes much sense. I think that, that non-realism is the idea that, you, that we simply can't adopt a stance that our language and thought uh, are describing the world. And in, in being non-realist, I would say the later Wittgenstein is non-realist. I would say Derrida is, is non-realist. You know, this, the, 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 there are some good uh, precursors for sure in, in that uh, camp. So what, what I'd like to do now is go from there to closure. But, but all I want you to do is give a short understanding of closure and why closure takes the elements with which we have begun, which is non-realism, self-reference being the pro problem that undermines realism, and explain how closure deals with that problem as an overview, then we'll go into a lot more detail later on. Yes, sure. So uh, maybe maybe as a way into that, maybe let me give a, a sort of very thumbnail sketch of, of how we've got to where we are in the last hundred years. So uh, back at the end of the 19th century, um, Fraser uh, in the Golden Bough uh, listed uh, views from around the world. They, you might think of them as uh, myths or religions or whatever, and he just listed them one after the other. And uh, the book was a, a sensation, it caused outrage. And the reason that it caused outrage it's because one of these views was Christianity. <laughs> and so he made it look as if Christianity was just one of lots of other ways of seeing the world and was just placed alongside them. And there was an implicit notion there that, well, no one of them could be true. <laughs> you know, that, 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 you know, there were similarities and differences all the way across it, but what could be special about this particular uh, framework? And so 
actually, uh, Fraser tried to get out of the, the, the outrage uh, by removing it in later volumes, but it didn't matter. The relativist genie was out of the bottle. And, and so the first sort of truths to fall in the 20th century were religious and moral truths because it was apparent that other cultures just had different ways of going about it. And then later we came to see that um, language itself changed the way we saw the world. It wasn't just that it was another um, outlook, but that it actually changed how we understood the world at all that uh, previously people had thought language just is transparent. It just describes how things are. And we came to realize, no, that's not right. The, the very categories of language change how we understand the world. So that's the next step. And then I would say that post-war, there was the, move, the relativist move somehow moved on to science. And people like Kuhn and uh, later Feyerabend demonstrated that the... the Science itself is context dependent. That Kuhn, first of all, in the context saying we scientists operate within a paradigm, they understand things within a certain sort of framework. But when that framework changes, the facts change as well. That the context changes how you see things. So by the time we get towards the end of the 20th century, um, this relativist genius has somehow encompassed almost everything. And in postmodernism, I think. With, with Derrida, it just went, went, went one step further. Uh, and Derrida just said, not only are there these different perspectives, but there is no meaning at any individual instant. There is no decidable meaning. So when somebody says something, you can never get to the bottom of what they said. So that was, that's, that's the sort of story of what's happened. And indeed, not surprising then that we, we now end ourselves uh, up in a situation where there's a a perspectival sort of picture of an almost indefinite number of ways of seeing the world. And the puzzle is, well, how, how do we identify a, anyone that's correct? Now, it seemed to me that um, that's all very well, but it's not a satisfactory position. You know, Derrida, if we take that right at the end of that process, Derrida's uh, uh, stance immediately falls to self-reference, because if, uh, if you can't get to decidable meaning, then he can't put forward the theory that there, is, there isn't decidable meaning. Uh, if you have to deconstruct everything you said, you have to deconstruct the idea of deconstruction. Um, that, that, that postmodernist frame just runs into the ground. And indeed, I think culturally, what's happened is it's left people lost. You know, they, they, they lost in the idea of competing frameworks, and no way of working out what to do. So it seemed to me we have to find a framework which is not assuming realism because we sort of know it hasn't worked and uh, uh, moves on from the, what, what a, for want of a better sort of summary, the sort of postmodern look of the world. And what closure is an attempt to try and do that. And what it does is it offers a slightly different vocabulary. There are lots of things that are similar to the vocabulary of, of subject and object or language in the world, but it offers a slightly different vocabulary. And it starts from what seems to be a deeply unlikely starting point. So it starts from the idea of, let's suppose that instead of thinking that the world is somehow out there divided into bits and really the puzzle of life and the puzzle of science and the puzzle of philosophy is somehow to discover how it really is. And instead of that, we think, no, let's think that the world is somehow not divided into bits. It's got no bits in it. It's not that sort of thing. It's something other than, than that. It's not made of things. And that starting from that, so thought that maybe we start from the, as it were, the opposite notion of realism. Not saying there's no reality, but there's there's um, that the the world is not something that we can that is we can divide into bits that we can find a solution for. Then the question is, well, how can we do anything? And the vocabulary that I explore then is that if we think of the world 
as open. And what we do with thought and language, and indeed sensation, is we close that openness. So the world is somehow infinitely open. And what we do is we, we close it and into things, if you like, our closures create um, the things that we surround ourselves with. So all of the, all of the objects around us, the people and the chairs and the, the ideas that we have are a consequence of this process of closure. And what closure is doing is it's holding the world as something in particular. So it takes all of the stuff out there and it holds it as something in particular. And by holding it as something in particular, we've then got a way of intervening. Now, let me give you a sort of more specific example of what that closure might be. So you think, well, you know, what the hell is all of this about? You know, how, how could that work? Let me give you an example, a scientific example. Of course, the example it adopts the framework, the, the, the paradigms of the present and so forth. Right? So I put, the, I put the example in parentheses, but nevertheless, it'd be a sort of a, an example. And let's take the, the eye and the visual apparatus of the eye. And so out the, the scientific story is out there, there's all the world, you know, all of the stuff. And, you know, photons come into the eye and there are hundreds of millions of neurons which are responding to those, uh, those photons. Now, if you take any one photon, sorry, any one uh, neuron, its response to the whole of what I would call of openness is really one of two things. It either fires or it doesn't fire. That's all it does. So within this sort of framework of closure, I'd say what's going on there is that the, the, the neuron is taking the whole of the whole of openness and it is responding to it by either seeing it as something that is firing or either by firing or by not firing. So it takes all of the stuff and it turns it either into a thing or a not thing by firing or not firing. And that's the character of closure, that it starts with the, the, the stuff that we, we can't get at, which is other than us. And it takes the stuff that's other than us and it produces something in response. And that thing in response, the closure, is, is different from, and in some sense has nothing in common with what, what's out there. <laughs> the, you know, the firing of the neuron is, is not a description of the world. It's a causal response to the world but it responds to the world by going through this process of closure. And, and a, on a bigger scale, I think that that's what's going on. There are multi layers of closure, which enable us to build up more and more complex ways of holding openness. It's not describing openness, our thought, it's not describing it, it's holding the world as something. And when we hold the world as something, then we are able to intervene on the basis of the way that the world is being held. So this is a fascinating new way to look at reality. Um, and I actually began to focus on the concept of openness and what that really means uh, out in the world, because that, that is the substrate on which closure is, is operating. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm forced into this maybe false dichotomy between epistemological and ontological. And I, I want to go back to your, your, your neuron example, because I think it's a good one. So the photon comes in, the neuron will either fire or not, which is a closure process. Um, but the neuron is not perfect. Maybe, maybe the neuron is, has degenerated. Maybe there's too much calcium. Maybe there's a, a, an anesthesia in the body that, uh, that prevents it from firing. That in no way affects whether or not the photon came originally. The photon came originally, had nothing to do with how the neuron responded, which could be in all different manners. So it seems like the closure then is an epistemological one, What, how we are 
um, uh, uh, imposing our sense or our awareness of what the reality is, but that photon reality is always there one way or the other, whatever it is. Yes, indeed. So how do I go to, so I would say in an overall way, the reason why it feels like that to you is because you're very attached to the idea of the, that, that there is the reality out here and that science has actually uncovered that in some way so that the photon is somehow the reality. And therefore, within that framework, it looks as if the operation of the neuron is a process of understanding the ultimate reality. While instead, I would want to say the very framework of photons of, of us as subjects and the world out there of reality are all concepts which are driven by this underlying closure, which has been built up over time and which we then imagine to be true. So let me give you another example. It's a big leap from where, where we normally are. So let me give you I'm, I'm, I'm prepared to go with you. I'm, re- I'm ready. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the boat. Yeah. So, so, so let me give you another thing. I don't know whether you saw that the, the, there was a, a film about a, a, um, a, an American uh, schizophrenic mathematician. I think it was in My Beautiful Mind, it was called. And anyway, there's a, there's a scene in it early on where he's sort of showing off to his girlfriend. <laughs> and, and he has a gr- fantastic ability to identify patterns in the world. It's one of the characteristics of his condition. And um, he turns to her and says, you know, name an object. And uh, I think she says a rose initially. And he scans the sky, scans the stars. And he says, oh, there. You can see the rose. You know, there's a shape. There's the stem, whatever. And she says, oh, God, that's amazing. And uh, he says, name another object. And... um, uh, and she says, uh, an umbrella. And of course, he, he finds an umbrella and starts. The, the, the point, of course, of the film is to just show how extraordinary he is in being able to identify these patterns. But actually, the number of patterns in the stars is unimaginably big, bigger than the number of particles in the universe. So even within a single bit of the sky of 100 stars, you can generate more patterns than there are of subatomic particles in the known universe. That's just within 100 stars, let alone the whole sky. So there's a, there's a, to all intents and purposes, an infinite number of patterns that you can generate out of those stars. And therefore, there is an infinite number of different objects you can find. But... They're not that none of them are descriptions of what's what's ultimately there. Um, they are just different ways of holding the stars. You might say, okay, that's, that's all very well. They're different ways of holding the stars, but you know that doesn't mean anything. Oh, it means a lot because once you've spotted the rose, I can use it to say to you, oh, look at the star just beyond the petal, or you can track the the rose across the sky, and use it to say what time it is. Indeed, if you pattern all of the shapes in the stars, you can use it to navigate around the world, which is what, of course, we did once upon a time. So you don't need any connection with how things are ultimately for the way that we close the world to be immensely powerful. But our closure doesn't change the reality that there were those hundred stars out there. How we close it with a rose or a a, a mechanism for changing time may be operationally, may be artistic, um, but it doesn't change the fact that there were those hundred stars originally in in some structure. So the word star is a word in a language on our planet. It is a way of holding what we see in the sky. The word sky is a way of describing what is above us. The word above is a way of distinguishing between the relationships of where we feel we are. They are all ways of holding the world. It's not as if they have got through to saying, oh, there really are stars, 
or there really are a, an above and a below um, or, or whatever. They're always, every single conceptual frame is a way of being able to hold the world. And, and there's no escape from that, as it were, um, the perspective that's embedded in the way that we're holding it. We can't get to this, this view from nowhere, as Hilary Putnam would describe it, of being able to somehow describe it independently of all of those characteristics. So when you say, oh, there are, you know, but there are a hundred stars out there, well, there's only a hundred within the numerical system of uh, the decimal system. There's only stars in the context of the way that we think about the things up there. I mean, the Greeks would have had a slightly different version. Um, the, 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 there is an indefinite, different number of ways of the way that we could talk about that stuff. And the puzzle, I think, once, once one appreciates that, you know, that that is sort of the way that it is that, that you can never get to the bottom of your descriptions, is how is it that they work? How could it possibly that they work, even though they don't have any connection with how things are in some ultimate sense? Uh, Searle, in, in, in your uh, uh, debate with him, used the example that Rembrandt uh, was born Did. in 1606, I think. Um, and that is um, susceptible to different calendars. Uh, 1606 relates to the so-called birth of Christ. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to uh, articulate that. So it, all of the words there can be done in, in different ways. So that in a sense, does that, that is not an absolute fact. It depends on your, the system. And I understand that. But there are ways that you can ground that in some, in some kind of reality. Just to pick an example, um, that you, you can say because fusion in the sun works at a certain process. So the percentage of, of, of hydrogen and helium uh, uh, it starts at very, very small and then gradually increases because the hydrogen fuses the helium. That what's caused the fusion of the sun to burn. So you could say that Rembrandt was born at a certain percentage of the sun's um, helium uh, uh, hydrogen percentage, and that that seems like an absolute timetable in 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 the universe to ground that birth as opposed to human systems. Yes. So I, I, I would say that that is to have imagined that the contemporary framework of science with indeed those notions of atoms uh, divided into hydrogen and helium and all of those sort of things has somehow reached through the perspectival character of language and described it how it ultimately is, you know, that there really are hydrogen atoms, there really are helium atoms. Now, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't buy that, nor, and I've been involved in you know, debates with, with scientists over this very, very issue, is that nor, it, it, in a way, the difficulty becomes apparent as soon as you start trying to describe what a hydrogen atom is. You know, if you get in there down deep and dirty, as it were, it, it turns out the hydrogen atom sort of disappears as you try to find it. I mean... Um, the is it does it consist of the proton and the neutron and the electron uh, and what about all of the space in between you know because most of the the hydrogen atom is the is the vacuum as it were in between the bits and uh, and then do you include the forces you know are, are the are, are the forces that are supposedly operating between the particles uh, you know part of the a part of the hydrogen atom or not. And if you try and answer each of those questions and you go a further layer down, it just gets more and more puzzling because you end up trying it being in a situation where you're having to say that, you know, reality consists of mathematics. There are some people, you know, realists who are forced into that position saying, well, actually, I can't find any ultimate stuff. Right. It's just mathematics. Well, hmm. I would say, look, it's not that it's just mathematics or information or some other sort of uh, rather crazy, I think, metaphysical move. It's that the very idea that your language is able to reach through and say how things are is mistaken. It's just that's not what's going on. 
Language is not describing how things ultimately are. Instead, it's a tool that enables us to intervene. And we build our closures in order to be able to intervene. And if they're no good, we get rid of them and we have a different one. And when they work, we, we hold on to them and then we use them to get things to happen. And you can see that in a baby. You know, when babies uh, begin, they don't know the difference between food and not food. They don't have that category distinction. So they try all sorts of things in their mouth. You know, every <laughs> as a parent, they no, no, don't put that in your mouth. <laughs> so, so uh, they are, they're, and they're making, they wouldn't have a concept at the age they're doing this. They don't have language. So I think their closures are operating at a non-linguistic level. So I don't buy the idea that language is everything at all. I think it's closure that's everything. And, and, and what, what's going on is that the, the, the baby is, is trying to distinguish between stuff that it needs to eat and stuff that it isn't, isn't stuff that you can eat. And it does that in all sorts of ways. And it gradually builds a closure about what is food. I mean, it doesn't come out, as I say, in that sort of verbal way at that point, but they are, through their other sensory closures, they're building that idea of what food is, and they refine that over time. And as they refine it, they get better and better of thinking, oh, I rather like that. It's yellow, and it's got that sort of thing, and I think that's something that I can eat. And that's how we build our closures. And then, when we grow up into adults, we're told... Oh, actually, you know, this obviously <laughs> happens through children. No, 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 it's not, you know, such and such isn't what you think it is. It's something else. So we correct them. And when we correct them, we correct them with the closures that we've grown and developed over time. So we somehow socialize children into our way of seeing the world and our categories. And then by the time we're adults, we imagine that our categories and our way of seeing the world is the world. And we just can't imagine what it would be to be others, and we're really sort of hooked on the idea that we've really uncovered how it is. Let's um, uh, approach closure from the substrate on which it works. Uh, we're talking a lot about the process of closure working on the openness of the world. So walk me back a little bit and let's let's get into the openness of the world. What, what does that really mean, the concept of openness? Uh, it, it might sound um, superficially like the future is open, like, you know, there's no God who has determined uh, the, uh, everyone's future, the, that the determinism is, is wrong, that, 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 that everything is open. But I think you mean it in a different way than that. Openness is, is it everything independent of us, all externalities? Mm. Um, you know, let, let's, let's explore and tease apart openness. Mm. Yes. So one way of imagining what I'm trying to say with the word openness is that it's just the stuff that's other than, than us. It's the stuff out there, if you like. But the very word out there is a way of categorizing w where it is. You know, th th those are words in our language. So I'm trying to have a word which is just referring to the, to the other. Now, um, there are people, there are philosophers who, who, who have you know, in doing this, have tried to refer to this sort of non-realist other and, you know, have fallen into the mistake of trying to describe it. <laughs> but if we could describe openness, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be openness. It would be our closure, because as soon as we describe it, we, we're using closure to describe it. So the word openness is just, in a way, trying to point to that which is other than us. And... And um, uh, I didn't use the word reality or I don't use the word reality because that gives us the wrong impression. It's got all sorts of baggage with it, reality, that it, yeah, sure, what we think sure. reality is like. So in a way, the word openness is just trying to say we can't get at this ultimate stuff out there for a very simple reason. You know, we are not that stuff. We make sense of it with what we do in our heads. And that's never going to be the same thing as the stuff out there. You know, the, the, the neurons in the eye are never going to be the same as the photon. It's a ridiculous notion. The, neuro, the, the neuron is a response to what's out there. And there's, in a sense, no connection 
between them. The question is why the firing of the neuron enables us to intervene in this stuff that is somehow other than us. And how does that process work? And, and how, but we can't ever, we can't, you know, we can't get through, we can't get through and somehow say how openness is, because if we did, it wouldn't be openness, it would be something else. Now, um, th th there is a bit of a paradox with the word openness, because there's always a risk that, you know, you, you might think the word openness is referring to something and try and examine, well, what exactly is this open? Why have you used the word open and so forth? And, and uh, I think at some, at some level that's true. And I think we could use uh, a, a different uh, word, but whatever we use, it would have this risk that, that, that there's a temptation to imagine that we might be able to explore it, but we're not going to be able to explore it. That's not, the re that's not our relationship to the world. What we have to do, and maybe the reason why I call it openness is because I think often realists imagine that if you say things are just open, that you're either denying that there is stuff out there or that um, we just make it up all in our heads in some sense. And that's not quite right either. The openness is a constraint, a very powerful constraint, as to what closures work. So it's not that you know there's no constraint out there, but it's just that our closures don't describe so, how it is. Again, the, the, the constraint seems to be ontological, and our in principle uh, incapacity to ever get to it sounds epistemological. <laughs> yes, well, I, I, I understand why you want to hold on to that, and that's because you want to hold on to the realist framework that there is something that is out there, and you want to say, but wait a minute, what is actually out there is, is independent of us, and what we are doing is epistemological in some sense. And I'm saying, no, 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 that you've already, you've already decided your metaphysics there. You've already, you've already decided that there is a real and that, and it's a question, it then pose, puts humans in the situation that their aim is to try and work out the real. And I don't think that, I don't think that is what we're up to. I don't think we, that we can work out the real because we can't, we can't do that. That's impossible. Um, uh, and, and so it's not like, well, there is an ultimate ontology which we're trying to discover. The very point is, the very point about openness is we have to give that up. We have to give up the idea that there's an answer, that there might be a guru on, a, on an Indian uh, retreat or a scientist in CERN, or indeed, dare one say, a philosopher who is going to somehow tell you the answer. Well, at some, at some level, we know at an inchoate level, that's ridiculous. It hasn't happened for the last uh, 10,000 years of civilization. And I don't, I, I, I would be quite comfortable say it's not going to happen for the next 10,000 years of civilization. And that's because that is not what is going on. That, that, that very idea, you know, life is a bit like a, 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 a crossword puzzle we're trying to solve. Can we just solve it somehow and then we'll get the answer? Oh, we'll be okay. No, 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 that's not what's going on. There are, there are many different ways we can hold openness, an indefinite number of ways we can hold it. And each of those different ways enables us to do different things and to make some is it were sense of where we are but there's no answer they're just there there will be ways to enable us to get things to happen maybe to get them happen better than they are at the moment to solve problems we have at the moment sure. but when it's operational i mean we we want, we want to get the ultimate re reality here and one of the terms that you use which i think is an interesting one is you, you say the world is a not thing that, that you you can't get at that thing but is that not itself self-referential? Because that's a that's an affirmative statement about how things are. Yes. So, so I, I would accept that as an initial criticism. But in some, de therefore, defence, when I was writing closure, because my first book was about self-reference, and it seemed to me self-reference has driven twentieth-century philosophy. It was critical to Wittgenstein and what he did. It's critical to Derrida and so forth. Of course, self-reference was actually 
absolutely uppermost in my mind when constructing the framework of closure. And therefore, one of the challenges for, for anyone who's going to put forward a non-realist account is both to account for how it is that um, uh, thought and language can be immensely powerful and yet not be uncovering reality. That's point one. And point two, it has to account for how the theory itself, the theory of closure, is in any sense possible. And the two are allied. So um, if we're going to talk in language, we always inevitably generate categories and things. We can't get away from that because that is the, that is the nature of closure. Closure generates things. There are some uh, philosophers, you know, Heidegger uh, used the process and Derrida to some extent of using a word and then crossing it through erasure, it was called. And the reason they used this process of erasure was to try and indicate that the word doesn't actually refer, that they used the word, but it can't actually say. So I did consider with openness, you know, initially I thought I'd write openness and then cross it through. So you just say, <laughs> don't, don't get imagined that it's pointing to something. <laughs> but, but, but um, and that and that is sort of true in a way throughout. But th that's not good enough. I I, I went away from erasure because I don't think it's good enough. You've got to account for the fact that you have to use words, you have to use categories, and then you have to account for why it is that they work, even though the very categories that you've used to do that will suffer from the same issues. So in a way. Uh, if I was being more careful or precise, rather than saying the world is not thing, I would say hold the world as not thing. Mm. And if you so think that, the world that, that, as that, being, imposes a, that imposes a closure. So if you hold the world as not thing, it means you're not saying that it is not thing, you're just saying right. think of the world as not thing. And hold the world like that. And if you operate with it like that, then you will find that it's much more powerful than you imagined it was going to be. Because initially it thinks, oh, how could this possibly be a, a valuable way of operating? But if you operate with that to start with, then you have the question of how you can build an account. Of the, fundamental idea, the fundamental idea, as, as it seems to me, is that closure imposes things in this not thing than the openness it it it, it yes. creates different yes. manifestations um and it's not just our uh personal constructs of it it's the the exist the, the the existence of it itself which is a you know fairly radical claim i don't, I don't think you'd object to that that comment um yes but it, you know, closure is a process to to divide this there's uh, in, indescript openness that we can never approach into into things. They can be concrete. They can be abstract. The, the, all of those are, are things. And closure is the process of creating or or imposing things on on the uh, on the totality of, of 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 the externalities. Indeed, and and one of the things that's been quite quite strange for me is that obviously. One way of interpreting what closure is doing, I say only one way because the, the, there are others, one way of interpreting it is rather akin to neuroscience. It's trying to give us an account of how we're able to build a picture of the world that works. But, indeed, um, neuroscience after the 20 years has, there are more and more neuroscientists who are saying things which are quite parallel to closure and saying, uh, that the brain is not uncovering some ultimate reality, and there's no ultimate reality that I I is there, and that uh, and to then describe how it might be that the brain is able to create a model of the world which it can operate on, but which is not somehow describing. No the question. Brain. I mean that's 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 got, that's gotten to be non-controversial. The predictive brain, uh, the fact that. When you have a cochlear implant, if you if you become uh, profoundly deaf, if you've had hearing as a young child, 
for the first t time you have the cochlear implant, you hear absolute noise. It just, it's just—it's like the television set set to a in-between channel. Zzz. But over time, uh, in a few months of training, you can hear almost perfect words because the brain takes that and reforms it. There are more uh, efferent ner nerve fibers from the brain to the sensory than the other way around. The brain is a predictive organ. So exactly. all of that is is become become mainstream neur neuroscience. Exactly. So I've had this weird sort of sensation that somehow neuroscience is gradually uncovering closure. And, and, and what, what I think, and I think if you understand contemporary neuroscience in the context of the framework of openness and closure, much of it just drops into it as an overall metaphysical frame. When uh, talking to neuroscientists, I feel that uh, sometimes I want to encourage them, actually just go a bit further and give up on the idea of uh, this notion of reality as a whole, as if you might, some, your theory is, is uncovering the essence of the brain. And instead, thinking, think, think of it as you are providing a model for how the brain might work. You're saying, hold the brain like this, and we will enable ourselves to understand how it is that we formulate uh, our notion of reality. But don't imagine that you're somehow getting there, because you'll never get there, because your theory suffers from the same problem as everything else, that it's that it's just, uh, it, it's, I say just, it is a way of holding the world. So yeah. uh, how does this articulate with uh, what's called a, a constructive empiricism, Bas van yeah. Frossen, yeah. Um, in, uh, the, you know, radical empiricism, yeah. Which, yeah. which is different than what you're saying, although it starts with the same sort of assumptions that it is, it, it is impossible in principle for any science to get at the real reality, we can discover regularities, we can discover yeah. relationships, yeah. but it's it's impossible in principle to get to that reality. The difference that I'm perceiving, though, is that they're saying there is some ultimate reality, it's just impossible to get to in principle. You're even denying that. Yes, exactly, exactly. So actually, I, I don't really have much in common with that because, you know, you they're really right. Like um, it's like an update on logical positivists uh, that and logical positivists I imagine that you know d data was uh, or facts were were identifiable. Uh, now it'd be in the concept that there are observables which are which which are identifiable. No, no, of course there aren't. Uh, uh, observables are, are are just as uh, locked into a particular frame. Uh, a, uh, a conceptual scheme. There is no, there is no fact. There are observables that you can get through to. So uh, I don't think it even, it, I don't think it remotely gets off the ground. Um, I think, I think you know, just again to put this into you know a more lo long term uh, philosophical story. It seemed to me that you know going back to. Um, a, you know, an, a, an 18th century philosopher, Kant. Okay? Kant started from the idea that there was knowledge. And what he thought we had to do is work out how must it be, how must things be in order to have knowledge? And I think the contemporary situation is exactly the reverse. We have to start from the somehow recognition that we don't have knowledge that we are always limited by perspective, that there is no view from nowhere. And then the puzzle is, how do you build a framework which um, accounts for how we can do stuff without um, it uh, uh, enabling us to have knowledge? And how do we refine our model in order to make it better and to make it more effective. And the framework that I put forward, I put forward in a really down-to-earth sort of almost scientific way of saying, I think that the, this framework will help us um, both uh, create um, uh, uh, you know, a better understanding of artificial intelligence, but also enable us to do things in the world and improve our theories and get it to be more effective. Uh, so, you know, there, there is a there is a sort of very practical sort of outcome of trying to do that. And it, it's it's not just a woolly philosophical theory that, oh, this all sounds rather nice about openness. It's about something that will really work, that actually really in the detail enables us to understand how we how we are thinking uh, and uh, and how we how we're intervening.
Let me ask just a couple of specific questions that come up about closure to see the the the, the sinews involved. Um, you say all closures are essentially fragile. What does that mean? I start off with trying to identify some of the key characteristics of closure. And, and one of the characteristics is that they always fail. We can hold the world as something, but it's never the same thing as the stuff out there. And we can elaborate that and try and make it better. But in the end, it's going to fail. And, and so that's one first thing about it. And the other is there are always alternatives. There, is, there are always other closures that will you know, enable us to do different things. So I think that many people initially, when they hear this account, feel nervous about it. They, they think, but you know, if I give up on the idea that the world is something in particular and we're discovering it, I'm going to be lost in this scary space where um, we've no idea what's going on. And, you know, I don't like this. So I would say, I think a bit rather differently, that what uh, the framework of openness and closure is doing is, is to say, it enables one to see that the world is infinitely rich and there is an infinite amount of potential. So instead of thinking, oh, this is a really scary place, you can think, well, we've got our current ways of understanding the world, and those are very effective in many ways. We don't have to chuck those away. They're very effective in many ways. But none of them is right. The closer we look at them, they all will fail. Uh, all of our libraries and our, our, our uh, theories of the world, you can be quite sure in 500 years' time, they will look back and think, oh, ha, ha, you know, that's what they thought back in, back in the dear old... Um, uh, you know, 21st century, um, uh, wasn't that, wasn't that, uh, and they'll patronize us just in the same way as we patronize the past. And that's just how it is, that there will always be other, and the, the excitement in a way about uh, openness and closure is that it liberates us from this idea that, you know, all we've got is, is what we currently see. So when we look around ourselves, people imagine, OK, well, I've got people and, and chairs and, you know, I've got some fruit on the table and there's cars outside and whatever. And it's like, well, that's what it is. Well, I would say, no, 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 no. Every single bit of your visual field, you can hold an indefinite number of ways. In just the sure. same ways you look at the stars and you don't have to hold it as a rose, you could hold it as countless other patterns. If, if for example... You know, you have a book and say, OK, that's what it is. It is a book. Well, it's also a collection of molecules. It's also an example in a conversation. It's also um, a vehicle for ideas. It's also a, a combination of organic material. It's also something you can burn on the fire. It's also, and you've got the idea, there is no limit to the number of ways you can hold this bit of the world. No limit. And that's true, not of this bit of the visual field. It's true of every single part of your visual field. So think of, therefore, the story of openness closure about a liberation, a realization of the extraordinary richness of the world and the potential of the ways that we close it to enable us to do different things. So each of those descriptions of this bit enables us to do different things. What is the mechanism or the machine of closure? You say that all forms of life can be closure machines. Yeah. Uh, is that something special yeah. about life? You don't have to be a human yeah. to impose closure. All life yeah. can do it. How about non-life? Before yes. there was any life, was closure yeah. happening? Yeah. It's sort of an analogy to yeah. to, to uh, yeah. quantum physics, where you have to have an observer. So, but it can be done. An observer can be another molecule that's not life. I mean, yes, it's a, it's a different argument in quantum physics, but it's the same kind of uh, application of of an idea that it, that's founded in, in in the human construct, and that yeah. now has to seemingly be applied, you know, broadly not only to all life but to all existence. 
years. Closure does apply in the framework that I put forward, does apply to all, all living things in the sense they all have to make sense of the space they're in and they make base their interventions on the way they make sense of it. So they are engaged in that observer process. And in order to make sense of that observer process, they've got to have some way of observing. And I think the process of closure, um, of course, the majority of the framework of closure, we've not talked about understandably in this, uh, in this conversation, but it's all about the detail of how we are able to build uh, the, the overall framework that we have. And a similar sort of framework, I think, would apply to, to organisms that are not human. I don't think there's anything that means that the framework of closure just applies to, to humans. Whether So before life, was, was there closure? Before there was any life? Um, well, I think that uh, you're tempting me into trying to say how things are, are in oh. an ultimate way. <laughs> I can't. I can't trap you. <laughs> uh, I. Uh, I. Uh, I'm of course not going to say that the account of openness and closure has somehow reached through and caught sight of how things are in some ultimate way. As if, it, well, I have cracked it. You know, we might not have cracked it for the last ten thousand years, but the story of openness and closure has cracked it, and therefore that's how things ultimately are. Instead, I would say the account of openness and closure is a powerful way of understanding our current circumstances. And in terms of, I think, the stories and theories that we've got on offer, I would make a case, not, not surprising that you, I would say, but I would make a case that it's a, a, our best chance of having a, a story that makes sense in, in, these, in these different areas. But of course, there will be future and different ways of, of holding things. And the characteristics of closure as a process itself apply to my theory. So there will be ways in which the framework of enclosure fails. Because if it, if it didn't, then it would have somehow reached through to reality. But that doesn't mean to say that I'm not going to constantly try and improve it in the way that I think science works. You know, science, I think, doesn't uncover how reality is. What it does, it puts forward a way of holding it. And then when it doesn't work, it tacks something on as well. So, you know, we imagine that, uh, that, you know, Newton sort of identifies gravity, gravity's there, you know, and the framework of forces, uh, he's discovered how it is. I don't think it's like that at all. What, what happens is he puts forward an overall framework and the, if you produce a counter example, he'll always come up with an explanation. So something behaves in a way which is not expected. He just says, oh, there's another force acting. So you go and hunt for the other force. And then, well, that doesn't work how it's meant to be. Well, there's something else going on. And so you keep on building your model. You fill the holes in the way that it intervenes. You gradually make it more and more sophisticated. And you end up with where we've got now. A huge system, immensely powerful, but it's got no closer to saying how the stuff is out there. So let's do this now. I have a series of, of questions related to the reality, assuming the reality of closure, um, and, and try to give very short answers to each one because they'll be very diverse. The first starts with your argument that the process of closure is what makes consciousness and language possible. Um, could we reverse the arrow of causation there such that consciousness and language is what makes closure possible? Well, I, I'm sure you could build a model that sort of was operating like that. The reason that I'm not doing like that is because I'm starting from the puzzle of how is it that language or thought enables us to say anything at all. So if, and until we've solved that problem, which was the problem of 20th century philosophy, I don't think we can make much progress. You've got to have a story about how our narratives and our language works. Because unless you have that, you, you don't have a way of saying, saying anything, as it were. You, don't, you can't get the thing off the ground. So if you invert it and you want to say, well, you know, consciousness was what enabled closure. Well, my question is, well, how, how is this word consciousness, you know, breaking through to you? What's your story of the, 
of, of the way that the word consciousness is functioning that enables you to do that. So I would be more inclined to, to well, I am more inclined to, to begin with closure. But I, I'm not saying that you couldn't build an account which somehow inverted that and, and sort of started with conscious, but it would have to account for the nature of the, how the word consciousness means anything. And so I think it would need a subset of a theory like closure. May, maybe you could put it that way around. Uh, you predict that uh, a dream of a natural order will always fail. And, and uh, that reminded me of Steven Weinberg's, uh, one of his early books called Dreams of a Final Theory, using the, both the dreams in the same way to find the natural order. Um, you know, he never realized that goal, and maybe that goal, even scientifically, is, is further away now than he imagined it then. But is your claim then that that is, uh, in principle, impossible? I, I think humans have always imagined that they are close to getting to a final account of things. And of course, I'm saying that they've never succeeded and they're not going to succeed. Um, Lord Kelvin, at the end of the 19th century, the, the, the founder of uh, thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics comes from Lord Kelvin. He founded the temperature scale. He said, uh, we've discovered everything, or words to the effect, we've discovered everything now. There's only, there's only ever more refined measurement left. That was before Einstein appeared, before uh, the atom bomb, before quarks, before all of those sorts of things. It is a human uh, uh, habit of imagining that we are capable and we are close to have, having cracked it. Stephen Hawking made the same mistake. You know, we're about to catch sight of the mind of God. He gave up that towards the end of his life and, and, and adopted a framework of models and so forth. It, it, it is a fantasy. Uh, in my view, it is a dangerous fantasy as well. And the reason that it's so, dangerous... Sorry? So given post-realism, the openness of the world and the closure of language, what are the implications for science? Oh, I think that it means that uh, science, science needs to give up the idea it's uncovering reality, but instead it needs to double down on the key tools that we've discovered over the last three or four hundred years, which is empiricism and rationalism. One of the weird things about the contemporary environment is that empiricism and rationalism have come in for lots of criticism, you know, uh, uh, either that uh, it embeds current uh, prejudice that, you know, rationalism is somehow, you know, male and, uh, and, and, uh, and not uh, something that we can trust, that it's empiricism embeds uh, prejudices of our time and so forth. I would certainly say, yeah, sure, you know, there are all sorts of ways in which they don't arrive at the truth. But they are the tools by which we improve our models, our closures of the world. And instead of giving up on empiricism and rationalism and holding on to the idea that the world is something in particular and we might have our reality, and if people don't have our reality, we're about to sort of, you know, come to, to loggerheads with them and indeed, no doubt, eventually have war over them. Instead of that, we should be abandoning the idea that our closures uncover how things are in some ultimate way so that we are more open to the potential of alternative frameworks and the way that we test our frameworks is are those those simple but enormously powerful um, strategies of empiricism and rationalism so if somebody puts forward a way of holding the world what you have to do is say well wait a minute it doesn't work over here how, how do you account for that now, of course, in the framework of closure, I would say they are always going to be able to give you some sort of explanation. They'll bolt on something, they'll, they'll try and account for it. But the way that they do it and how that then, how their framework evolves, become, gets to a point where you think, actually, I, I can't buy that. that that's just not going to, that's not going to function. So we have to um, use that, of, of use empiricism and rationalism to improve our accounts of the world, our closures and models of the world, and at the same time, to enable us to be open to alternatives, which is there's always an infinite number of other alternatives out there. 
What are the implications for politics? You call realism dangerous. Timothy Williams, in your uh, excellent debate with him, uh, says the opposite, calling non-realism dangerous. Aren't both kind of irrelevant? I mean, we all want a better world politically, socially, morally, uh, yeah. but it, it doesn't sound like the, the, the nature of reality, the cosmos has any obligation to make our politics better. Well, I, I think it's a question of what you think our closure is doing. For the baby, making the closure between food and not true food enables it to live. It enables us to do something it couldn't do otherwise. So getting our closures better, I wouldn't say right, getting them better is a very important thing to do. And we need to keep on doing that. We also need to recognize that we can always make them better or there's a better one out there. They're never going to arrive. We can make our accounts of the world better, but we're not arriving somewhere um, uh, uh, along the way. And in a and in a, a, a political context, I think the idea that, you know, we have seen how the way the world is, you know, this is how it is, and we're right, and the people we are opposing are wrong, is dangerous. Instead, we can argue for the way that we see things, we can point to its strengths and weaknesses, and when somebody else opposes us, we need to stand in their way of holding the world to understand what might be going on and then to have a way of being able to intervene in it. So, you know, it, it, indeed, I, 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 it, just recently in the context of the terrible events in, in the Ukraine, I think the Western response, one, one way that has been fundamentally limited is a failure to really see what Putin is saying. Not so that we can somehow ally with him and think, oh, well, he's, that's all fine but just so we understand the worldview that he's operating from. And instead, the first reactions to the Ukraine said was also sort of, oh, he's mad. Oh, he's completely irrational. Oh, um, you know, uh, he's crazy. Um, uh, he'll obviously fail. Well, it doesn't take very long to realize that's not, that's not, not a very plausible story. He's been enormously successful. He's an intelligent man. The people who've met him know he's super intelligent. He hasn't suddenly gone crazy. What we need to do is understand his, his worldview, if you like. We understand what his story is. Not so we then say, oh, well, you're right, you know, that uh, in fact it's all the West's fault and, uh, and Ukraine is really ours. No, but it does mean we have to listen to what he says and take what is said seriously. And the West completely failed to do that, completely failed to read the speeches that P Putin was, uh, was giving. And, and there is an extraordinary situation in the West at the moment, which is there's all the talk about how uh, the, the news is censored in, in Moscow. But when did you last see on the Western uh, uh, news uh, any extended speech from Putin? Never. Never. And you think, I think well, what, what's going on here? Well, why is that? And it's because we don't want to hear it. It's sort of like, actually, no, no, we don't, because this is propaganda. It's, it's, it's sort of evil. I think, no, no, no. Of course, there's, an, there's, an, it, it, there's a mistake here that to, to imagine that to understand somebody else's framework and to listen to what they have to say means that you therefore agree with it. That's not right. But it does mean that if you're going to engage in some communication and you're going to try and work out how to respond, you've got to listen to how they see the world. And it's not how you see the world. It's a different way. And it's no good just thinking, oh, well, they don't see the world like I do. So they're mad. Well, whenever anyone says that, you know they've gone wrong. Let's talk about the implications for theology. Uh, given post-realism, I assume we can never know whether God exists, which is epistemic, but post-realism doesn't seem to be the kind of category to address, in fact, whether God exists, which is ontological, the same, the same tension. So what, what are the implications for theology? As far as theology is concerned, or, or, or that vocabulary, I think that they are, like science, a way of holding the world. 
So to propose that the world, you know, there's a God and that uh, there are certain sorts of consequences of that and how you go about it is a way of holding the world. The, the question is whether it is a valuable and useful way of holding it. And no doubt each of us will make our own judgment about whether that is a closure we want to buy into. I don't think it's a question of, well, does God really exist out there? Because I don't think any things exist out there. And God is just one of those things. So, so that's, a, that's a fantasy. Uh, but I think that, that, that you can think of religion as a framework to, to, to intervene and to, to organize your life and or organize society. And indeed, there are theologians who have found the framework of closure, closure interesting because it, it at least somehow punctures the notion that science is the only story that might work. But I am equally critical of, of, of most religions because actually faced with uh, uh, challenging their, uh, their framework, uh, there, are, there are lots of holes and uh, there are many aspects of them which I think, well, I, I'm not terribly comfortable with that. But uh, on the other hand, they have some strengths. What's the relationship between closure and process philosophy or, or process theology? Yeah, so I, I, I think, again, some people have put, mentioned this to me in the past, and I think uh, process, process philosophy is realist in the sense that, that, that process philosophers imagine that the world is made of processes that's just not made of things. And so you can imagine what I'm going to say to that. I don't think that processes are out there any more than things are out there. You could build a philosophy, as you know, Whitehead did, um, uh, of, of how you might see the world in terms of process and the, use that to be able to intervene. But the process philosophy I, I'm aware of is realist in character, imagines that it's discovering how the world really is. It's made of processes rather than things. And I think that that's no further forward than imagining that it's made of things. You complete the story of closure, not as a destination, but rather, uh, as you call it, a temporary resting point. Yes. Uh, there is no safe and final truth, you say. Closure is about a temporary means of holding the world, which is the phrase that you use, a very interesting one, that has the appearance of holding fast that which, it's a wonderful phrase that you have to conclude, that which cannot be held at all. So when I came to that end, I just didn't know whether I should be pessimistic or optimistic. Yes. So, I mean, thank you for pointing that, that phrase out, because I, I think, um, I mean, I, I find in some sense that, that, that idea an uplifting one, that it's a way of understanding the world which uh, helps us intervene, that is powerful in all sorts of ways, that accounts for the success of science, which identifies how we might be able to use things in order to make them better. But it is it has a humility to it of, of, of saying, but it, this way of holding it is, uh, is uh, not, in the end, uh, able to say how things ultimately are. And, uh, and that it just has a good go at trying to do so. Uh, but uh, recognizes it, it, its limitations. Hillary, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I'm very much looking forward to, to more. Um, we're just scratching the surface. I think the implications are extremely important. And I also look forward to the Institute of Art and Ideas and Closer to Truth figuring out ways to work together. I think in, in closing, in, uh, in our independent closures of the world, which we both impose, uh, we have great commonality and complementarity. So thanks for the conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed it and look forward to our working together. Uh, well, I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. There are so many points of contact between us. It's been a complete pleasure talking to you. And th th thank you for being so engaged in the, in the framework. I mean, I've really appreciated it. Uh, Really appreciated your questions. It's been it's been great. Thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. Good. Well, thank you very much, and uh, on to next. Exactly. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.